Hi everybody, my name is Bob Lord, Senior Technical Advisor with NCSD. I'm Jack Cable, also Senior Technical Advisor at CISA. So we're super happy to be here today to talk to you a little bit about CISA's Secure by Design initiatives. But, you know, before we do that, let's talk a little bit about what other industries outside the software industry look like once we're a little bit more mature. If you take a look at this graph, you'll see a couple of lines. There are some blue lines moving up and to the right. Those represent both population in the United States as well as the number of vehicle miles uh, traveled. And as you can tell, going back to 1920, the number of miles has increased along with the population of the United States. That red line is coming down, and that is the number of deaths per billion vehicle miles traveled. And what's really kind of interesting about this is although the lines for the population and, and miles driven has been going up, the fatalities have been coming down. And we think that's astonishing. Uh, we also think it's astonishing that this industry has collected a ton of data going back to 1920. That's not something we have a lot of in the world of software. Other industries have things like NHTSA, which can track things like the uh, number of fatalities, uh, and they track very specifically about the makes and models of the automobiles involved and the conditions and so on. You can go download this data yourself and slice it and dice it. In fact, some people have, and they've been able to find some remarkable improvements in automotive safety as a result of that. If you take a look at the NTSB dashboard, and I encourage you to go do this, you can see different kinds of uh, accidents. You can find out when they happened, where they happened, different kinds of conditions, and then you can actually drill into the root cause analysis to figure out which are the contributing factors that resulted in this particular accident. Again, that's not something that we're accustomed to in the world of software. So how do we compare? Well, we're not completely without data. It turns out that we have lots of sources of information about breaches and how they happen. But one of the things that we always wonder to ourselves is, how does this data help customers? How do the defenders better protect themselves? And how can they help the manufacturers who are making the software? How can they help those manufacturers make safer software? So I think that's an open question. And many of the sources of data that we have in the industry don't really lead us to helping customers and manufacturers as much as in other industries. So, a little bit of background. Jack? Great. So how do we get to this safer future? Well, in April of this year, we released, along with a number of both domestic and international partners, the FBI, the NSA, as well as the UK, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Germany, and the Netherlands, we released a white paper on Secure by Design and Secure by Default. And in this paper, we outlined three principles for technology manufacturers to take to build products that are more secure by design. This is very much in line with the national cybersecurity strategy laid out by the White House earlier this year, which talks about shifting the burden from those least capable, like schools, small businesses, state and local governments, onto those most capable, namely these large technology manufacturers. So what are we seeing today? We're seeing across the board that customers of technology products are having to bear the burden when it comes to unsafe software, where really they're needing to apply patches every day, they're having to look at logs, they're having to buy security products to compensate for unsafe products by design. They have to deploy hardening guides that can often be lengthy, take actions to make the product they're buying safe. Um, rather than the tech manufacturer building a product that is safe out of the box. So how do we want to change this? Well, we see that when products are being built today and when incidents happen today, um, there's a lot of work that happens right of boom where there might be an investigation. A company that's affected might notify CISA or law enforcement. They might decide whether or not to pay a ransom they'll likely go and look a little back to see, okay, when was this vulnerability exploited? What was the initial intrusion vector? They might even go further and say, okay, how did we expose this vulnerability? But really what doesn't happen far enough and where we want to take the conversation to is what happens in that product development life cycle where when was the vulnerability introduced? What specific actions did the manufacturer take or did they not take 
that led to this vulnerability being there in the first place. Because at the end of the day, our hypothesis is that no amount of time spent in phase five will compensate for vulnerabilities that are introduced in phase one. We need to be looking much earlier in the process to see how can we systemically eradicate vulnerabilities rather than continuing to deal with the consequences of them being present. So as a result of this, in the white paper we published, we outlined three underlying secure by design principles that we urge software manufacturers to take um, to help shift this burden as articulated in the National Cybersecurity Strategy. First, we want manufacturers to own security outcomes for their customers. Um, so rather than the ball being in the court of the customers to constantly apply patches or deal with the consequences of these products, we want manufacturers to take full responsibility for that. Second, we want manufacturers to lead the way with radical transparency and accountability. This means publishing statistics, for instance, on trends in their products, publishing detailed common vulnerability enumeration entries um, in order to articulate what the root causes of their vulnerabilities are and so on. We think that the more information out there, the better so that other manufacturers can learn what to do or what not to do. And lastly, we urge manufacturers to build organization structure that accounts for this and really making sure that the CEO down sets the priority of security that's not just relegated to the chief information security officers in the company, but rather it's a top business priority across the board. Okay, so let's get into secure by design and secure by default. What do we mean when we talk about this? First, with secure by design, um, this really is something that is a business level goal so um, it needs to be built into every phase of the product development life cycle. It starts even before the design of the product, and there's often real trade-offs involved where there's no easy way to just add this into the product. It's gonna take a lot of hard engineering work, but ultimately we'll, we'll get into, we think the trade-off is well worth it given the, the scourge of cyber attacks we're seeing today. And lastly, it really can't be added on later. There's attempts, but all too often, the cost is greater and it doesn't lead to as strong security as if it's built in from the start. Okay, so we've talked a lot about cars and analogies to the auto industry. Bob, do you wanna tell us about the this is my Chevy favorite slide. And so this is, a, this is a device that um, you could buy after you bought your beautiful 1962 Corvair. You could buy this uh, because the manufacturer noted uh, that there were some there were some defects uh, with the with the car, um, and so these aftermarket products were available. And what they said is in the advertising keeps both wheels working when cornering or driving in gusty winds. And that sounds like hyperbole, but it turns out the uh, Corvair had this tendency to be involved in what they call one car accidents, where the car would just sort of spontaneously get out of control and flip over. <clears throat> so. Uh, this was a device that you could buy and bolt it onto the frame of your car that allegedly would reduce the prevalence of this kind of danger. And from reading the comments on Reddit, it was never really clear that it did what it was supposed to, which I think is a perfect metaphor for cybersecurity products. We certainly have a lot of those camber compensators today. So let's look at some examples of secure by design in the software world. So we, we talk a lot about these specific tactics. For instance, memory safe programming languages where um, a fun fact, or, or maybe not so fun, but a majority of vulnerabilities today in memory unsafe languages, so think C and C++, are caused by memory safety vulnerabilities. And these are the sorts of vulnerabilities that can be eliminated by switching to a memory safe programming language, which is pretty much any language other than C and C++. Um, likewise, other techniques to eliminate entire classes of vulnerabilities like parameterized queries, where we've seen SQL injection in the news a lot lately, and there's techniques that have been around for decades to eliminate these vulnerabilities. Uh, furthermore, we talk about things like software build materials. We need ways of understanding what's actually in the software we buy. Likewise, vulnerability disclosure policies. Uh, companies need to make it easy for security researchers to get in touch with them, disclose vulnerabilities, receive legal safe harbor in doing so, um, and furthermore, then integrate that into their vulnerability management process so they're actually eliminating the root causes of those vulnerabilities and not just a superficial uh, cause. So really, that's what we mean by secure by design. And now Bob will take us into secure by default. Thank you, Jack. 
<clears throat> so secure by default, um, what do we mean by that? Well, a few things. One is that we want the configurations to be secure out of the box so that the, uh, the person who's deploying it doesn't have to be an expert. And we want the manufacturer to take responsibility for that, uh, for the outcomes of what happens, so that they're not just sending the product into the marketplace and hoping for the best. Um, we want things like um, alerts, so an MFA like uh, push <clears throat> for security uh, defaults, and if you don't have that, uh, we want to make sure that the uh, customers are alerted to that fact. We heard uh, Jack talk earlier about hardening guides. Well, we'd like to turn that upside down and start talking about loosening guides. So rather than have a product that's unsafe when you get it, uh, and then you have to figure out how to make it less dangerous, we'd like to start talking about the concept of a loosening guide where the product is safe out of the box and it's then your responsibility to take additional compensating controls if you decide to modify those defaults. And of course, we want this all at no extra cost and no extra licenses required. Um, and it should go without saying that we want this to be the default in every product. You shouldn't have to buy a separate one after the fact. So, what are some examples of secure by default? Well, how about we can start by eliminating default passwords? Even today, many products ship with default passwords. Guess what criminals love? They love default passwords. Single sign-on at no additional cost. This may surprise some of you, but many vendors charge more for products when you want to add single sign-on, when you want to have a centralized user um, database, and they actually charge you more for the privilege. High-quality audit logs at no extra charge, making uh, redu reducing the uh, hardening guide size uh, and turning that into a loosening guide. Security settings, so that user experience of, of setting a certain, uh, changing certain configurations, that should be a good experience that tells you about the risks you're taking on and much, much more. Great, so the Secure by Design ecosystem is quite broad, as you can see here, and really we need to make sure that we're reaching everyone because ultimately what we, we need to do is change an entire industry. And to do so, we're not gonna just uh, be able to do that alone with talking with the technology manufacturers. Of course, that's a needed component, but we need to understand the open source community, what their unique needs are, how we can really make sure that we're supporting the, the open source ecosystem we all rely upon. We need to look at education to see, okay, what is the workforce of software developers that are being produced? How can we make sure that they're aware of security in their everyday work? Likewise, how can we influence customers to be able to tell whether products are secure by design and to make purchasing decisions because of that? Um, and, and so on. So really there's a room for everyone and we, we encourage you to engage with us so that we can start to understand what unique constraints and abilities there are um, in each of these stakeholder groups. So, um, shifting the balance. Today we hear a lot about uh, the potential costs from the manufacturers about how products can be built to be secure out of the box and they correctly note that there will almost certainly be some additional costs when we talk about their SDLC or their software development lifecycle. <clears throat> and that's absolutely true. We also think that there are some potential areas of exploration where they can look more at their existing processes to understand what are the repeated patterns of vulnerabilities that they see in their products and what can they do to remove entire classes of vulnerabilities. So we think that there are actually some potential cost savings there. But when we talk about costs, we wanna talk about the larger, uh, the larger landscape. And so we wanna talk about the cost to the customers who have to deploy these things. So left of boom, they have to buy security products, they have to hire staff if they can do that, they pay the single sign-on tax, and so on. There's a lot of hard costs. And they also have to pay some soft costs. So somebody has to deploy that hardening guide, somebody has to train the users, they, somebody has to patch. There's just a ton of soft costs. That's left of boom. Once there's an incident, there are additional costs, both hard and soft costs, hiring incident response firms, hiring outside counsel, and so on. And one of the ones that we don't talk enough about is the loss of executive productivity. So when executives are dealing with a breach, it's very expensive on their, on their time. And because you can't do all of these things, you are left with this residual risk. And we wanna make sure that we're talking about 
all of the costs, including residual risks. And the end point here, the, the thing that we really want to stress is we want to start moving those costs left into the product development life cycle to reduce the burdens uh, on the customers downstream. All of this, of course, is uh, assuming that individual companies make their own rational decisions for where they want to assess their risk. We think that there's another conversation outside the scope of this talk around the national security delta. The idea being that when everybody makes a very rational decision about their costs and their risks, there is still a uh, residual risk, which is basically the, the sum of all of the risks together is greater than some of its parts. And then finally, bottom line, we want to take all of these costs and move them left so that we're dealing with a much more balanced approach to cybersecurity. Great. So now that we've laid out what we're trying to accomplish with Secure by Design, I'll talk a bit about how we want to get there. Um, really, in our strategy that we are uh, developing for CISA, we have three goals. We want to establish CISA's role in furthering Secure by Design, and this really means integrating into the entire workforce at CISA um, what it means to push uh, companies to be more secure by design. We held an internal Secure by Design Summit back in June where we gathered together all CISA employees and are continuing to push forward on that. Second, we really want to collect data and best practices so we can know what good looks like and how we can help steer companies to do the right things when it comes to building secure by design technology. Um, this includes looking, for instance, at CVE, uh, Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures, to see how we can get better root cause data into those CVE entries so that um, much like we see in the auto industry or other industries, we can begin to analyze trends over time and know what root causes we should be working to drive down at a systemic level, not just one-off patches, but actions like memory safe programming languages or parameterized queries to eliminate entire classes of vulnerabilities. And third, we want to drive adoption of secure by design best practices really across the board. We recently announced a pledge with K-12 ed tech vendors to take specific actions around secure by design. We're really excited about this as a way to make products that students and teachers across the country rely upon more secure by design and want to replicate this in other sectors as well so we can really drive forward um, specific commitments from tech manufacturers as well as working with international partners to increase adoption of the principles we've laid out. And lastly, how can you help? How can you get involved? Well, first of all, of course, we urge you to take a look at our white paper and associated documentation. Uh, we're working on a second draft of our Secure by Design principles. Keep an eye out for that. Take a look at the history of safety in other fields. Reach out to us to share lessons learned that you've seen in uh, your workplace or elsewhere. And really, lastly, look for opportunities to drive forward secure by design and secure by default. Whether you're at a technology manufacturer, see how you can really build into your roadmap secure by design, gather metrics and engage stakeholders around this. Um, if you work in academia, see how you can tie security into computer science curriculums. If you work in the open source community, see how you can really um, build momentum to generate uh, sustainable and healthy and secure open source communities. And please do engage. Um, our email address is on the bottom here. We want your help to make this happen. And with that, thank you for your time. And please do reach out if you have questions.